the problem with biodiversity monitoring is that it still uses very traditional techniques um, and as such it's really slow and problematic to monitor um, at a large scale and this means that almost all species more than 99.99 percent .99 are still unmonitored um, even from recent um, this this problem with with um, monitoring has has seen a need for like automated biodiversity monitoring and a new sector has emerged called conservation technology and this uses well-established forms forms of tech at, but applies it to monitoring conservation and and biology some of the examples here are biotelemetry um, which tracks individual animals using satellite techniques aerial imagery which is looking at large-scale changes over time this is really useful for detecting deforestation and large-scale environmental change and camera trapping which is really important for looking at species level and identifying individual species using using a video camera and a PIR sensor so some of the problems with conservation technology is that biotelemetry bio for example um, is very expensive aerial Im imagery you can't get underneath the canopy and get ground level monitoring and camera trapping is very limited in spatial scale meaning you can only monitor animals that are in field of view of the camera so that's why open acoustic devices focuses on acoustic monitoring because it addresses some of these challenges that other conservation tech tech has it can detect um, targets which can't be seen it can be used under the canopy or sea but the problems with acoustic monitoring are oh, down if you could go back a back a slide that would be good um, some of the problems with acoustic monitoring is that um, before open acoustic devices it was extremely expensive to do um, they often used really high quality microphones which weren't needed they were large and heavy which they weren't very power efficient and they were very difficult to use and this made them really infeasible to scale and use at large scale so to address these issues we developed audiomoth which is a really simple acoustic logger that records um, animal and environmental sounds to micro sd card the device um, records audio and oh, if you can go back back again danny still on the uh, sure. yeah the device records um i'll yeah danny i'll, I'll say next slide um okay so um, perfect it records it records um audible and ultrasonic sound and samples about 384 kilohertz which means it can record um, even bat ultrasonic calls. The device um, is called Audio Moth after the flying insect, the moth, which is known to have the um, most extreme hearing out of any animal in the world. Um, it can so, some species of moth can listen up to 300 kilohertz, which helps them avoid bats when they're feeding. Um, the device is runs on AA batteries, three AA batteries, um, and it's really simple to configure. Um, it's minimal in, cons in its construction and it's minimal in functionality as well. But this minimalism creates a, a, um, a very flexible device that can be used in multiple scenarios. Um, we, like some of the examples of the um, scenarios is that can be used as acoustic logger. You can run detection algorithms on the device. The whole device can be converted into a USB microphone, which means you can change, make the, the device used on your on your Android phone as a real time bat detector. Um, we Audiomoth originated from a, a research project, um, which was a collaboration PhD collaboration between myself and co founder Peter Prince. Um, next slide, slide please, Danny. So from the very start of our of our PhDs, we knew very little about conservation and the users that would use our product. So it was really important very early on to immerse ourselves in conservation work and around conservationists. 
Um, we even joined a conservation club where we joined weekly meetings to learn about how conservationists and users you monitor and use the device. Um, we this picture um, is one of our first first ever deployments where we deployed our first prototype, and it was um, Central America. Um, behind me there is is a conservation scientist called Evelyn, and she studies jaguars. And you can see in front of me there there's a there's a, a poster that says no hunting, no mining, and no logging. Um, and it was quite shocking to go out into the field for the first time. Um, next slide, Danny. Oh, sorry. Um, I think you already changed slide. If you if you go back a slide, Danny. Um, so as we walked through the forest, we came across evidence of, of hunting. So that first picture is a, a machete carved arrow. And as we followed these arrows, we followed the hunting trails. Um, we came across loads of shotgun shells and eventually came across camps and hunting platforms. These hunting platforms were built underneath fruit trees and hunters would, would sit there and wait for animals to go underneath and shoot them as from at close range as the animals would feed on the, on the dropped fruit. Uh, next slide. Um, so the, the problem, the problem there was out there is that forestry department and the local conservationists didn't really know how to, how to, how to stop this from happening. They didn't know how many gunshots were happening, were, were occurring. And this was a real problem for the local Jaguars who were almost extinct in the area because human humans were competing for the same, same meat and diet as the Jaguars. So um acoustics is a really good way to um monitor gunshots as you can as you can detect the um shotgun and, and um, create an algorithm to run on the device um and this was much more efficient than sending a patrol out um for a, a patrol every day to monitor these gunshots so we worked um our first project was work, working on an algorithm to detect these gunshot events um so th this is a picture of a, of a forest ranger helping us collect data to train the algorithm. Um, and we shot about 150, 150 shotgun blasts to train, train our detection algorithm, which was a machine learning classifier that, that ran on, on a M4 microcontroller. Um, our, we deployed it for a year running on batteries and it picked up about 70 gunshot events um, only in a small area in the reserve. Um, next slide, Danny. Back in the UK at the same time, we were looking at this species of cicada called the New Forest Cicada. And this was the only native cicada in the UK. Um, it hadn't been seen since the 1980s. And researchers um, that that listen to it um, rely on their hearing, and this this species of cicada call it fourteen kilohertz. So, the aging scientists that were that were monitoring it um, start started to lose lose the ability to um, their frequency their frequency response to their hearing started to go, and they couldn't hear this species anymore. But with with AudioMoth and a MEMS microphone, you can actually capture this this sound and start flood, flooding the nat nature reserve with devices. And you can actually listen and um, start collecting data for this, this, um, this species. Um, next slide, please, Danny. Um, another project we worked on very, very soon after developing our first prototype was um, monitoring climate change in Kenya. This species of bird is called the Turaco and it's um, quite a rare bird and it doesn't migrate. It's not a very good flyer and it re is really sensitive to temperature. 
and it has a very distinct alarm alarm call. And as as temperature changes, changes this bird moves up and down its mountain habitat. Um, and if you can measure this call using acoustics, you can start identifying where, how high this bird's climbing, and, and you can work out the effect of climate change it's having on, on the bird itself and measure climate change using using this bird. And this this bird is called the indicator species, and it's quite common in conservation to, um, to measure these. Um, next slide, please. Um, and the last, the last um, project we worked on was um, the Cuban greater funnel-eared bat, and these projects were still very early on in the first first few months, first years of, of developing our device. Um, and this is the Cuban greater funnel-eared bat project, and here we worked with the Zoo, Zoological Society of London and the ZSL um, to monitor this really rare species. This species was discovered in 1992 and it's endemic to one cave in Cuba. Um, with, with acoustics, um, you're able to monitor this device at large scale. Um, there's a few people's uh, microphones that are on that are, um, that I can hear. Oh, sorry. Um, so, the yeah the Cuban great funnel in that. Let me just make really... sure. I mean, I apologize. Apologize. Oh, hello. Yeah. So the the Cuban great funnel in that. Um, um, needs acoustics. Um, it is really impossible to monitor this bat without acoustics because it needs um ultrasonic an ultrasonic device to to monitor its its range. Um. Previously, commercial devices were much too expensive, um, and you you couldn't um, monitor the device at scale effectively. Um, next next slide, please, Danny. Um, so, in the very first year, we started to build up uh, a user profile working with all these conservation scientists. Um, and we built this profile to, to create a list of user requirements. So what we found is that they're biologists, ecologists, local communities. They often had low funds to buy equipment and little electronic experience. Um, and they needed to have large scale projects to, to create more impact. And so they can actually change policy with their research. And they're quite practical and had a DIY culture. Um, next slide, please. Um, as part of part of the um, the project, we also came across lots and lots of challenges. Um, and the main one we're going to focus on in this session is how can we scale the use of acoustic monitoring. Um, other challenges we came across was how we can make it easy to use in the field. How can a device be powered for long term in remote areas? How can it withstand extreme weather change? How can we enable large scale deployments? How can we process on device? And how can we support the device? So yeah, this session, we're going to focus on how we scale the use of acoustic monitoring, which is really important to protecting biodiversity. So we went we went and looked at the collaborative economy um, and the collab collaborative economy is um how consumers and creators share resources um to address their needs and wants and part of the collaborative co economy is the open source movement so if we made our design files openly available it means more people can start um using our device and creating it um, it's a good way to make our instructions available and they're, they're written out really, really well in open source, open source nature. Um, we also took inspiration from the open source hardware movement um, with devices such as Arduino and Raspberry Pi and made our hardware very minimal in construction. Um, and this made it easier to build. Next slide. 
So the DI approach was great because it means people could build the device for free. But what we found um, in reality after deploying, this is us deploying our device in Central America, is it's not very practical at scale. Um, it always required us to go out into the field with the conservation scientists and build the device for them. For them, um, and it, there was real barriers to entry for conservation scientists because um, they lack the knowledge, the electronic design knowledge. Um, next slide, please. So, because it because it's so hard for conservationists to build hardware themselves because they lack they lack the um, the educational ex previous experience we decided to look at turnkey manufacturing and one of the one of the companies we, f we found was called circuit hub um, and they so turnkey manufacturing is is when you order something um, electronic product and it comes comes ready to use um, now this, this is really useful as conservation scientists could order the device with a click of a button. Um, next slide, please. But the problem with it is that conservationists only ever really wants to buy 10, 10 to 12 devices. Um, so there's no economy of scale for users wanting fewer devices. So at low volumes, the price was high. Um, there was also operational barriers. So if there was any ever a component stock issue, conservation scientists would need to come to us for, for us to find a replacement. And that means, means they had no confidence in ordering. Um, so what we needed is a way to combine users together and create an economy, scale, economy of scale and create a, a um, collaborative way of, of, of purchasing. Um, next slide. Danny. So, um, yeah, so collaborative consumption was the way to go. So we, we came across a company called Group Gets, who were in Reno. Um, and they what they do is, is the turnkey manufacturing as well as the distribution. And they bring everyone together, um, collect the funds and take care of take care of everything so you can just get on with with creating the device so we we partnered with our Robada initiative at the time we did this we were still researchers so we weren't interested in making profit so our, our Robada initiative is a non-for-profit company um, and then with the what with wild labs which is a conservation community um, they put pu they publicized the fact that Audiomoth was doing a group a group purchase campaign um, so the single unit price we offered was forty nine ninety nine, plus shipping, and if we could get to at least two hundred backers, we would break even and not lose any money. As soon as the campaign started, it was it was extremely successful, and um, we managed to get sell out within twenty four twenty four hours. And in the end, we actually made made a bit of a profit, which we were we were quite surprised surprised with. Um, Next slide. So, yeah, so we actually made a profit in the end. Um, so we're now on we're now on the fourteenth group purchase campaign of Audiomoth, and it's now an integral part of our of our business business model. Um, with Group Gets doing doing all of the. Um, distribution and manufacturing it means we have more time to develop and support the customers um, and it's worked really well really well for us into the future um, and we've come out with some really cool cool products um, next slide um, so since since then um, Using Group Gets and the start of our research, we, we've now delivered about over 30,000 Audiomoths worldwide. We've discovered new species in Brazil, some bush, bush cricket, which um, use acoustics um, to communicate. And they are identified as new species based, based on the spectrogram that they, they call that. Um, Audiomoths have been used in national bat, bat surveys, 
um, which has never been done before. Um, people use Audio Moth for global biodiversity inventories, and there's currently one going on around the world now, looking at um, biodiversity around the world. And because Audio Moth is so low cost and easy to use, it's really, really useful to do citizen science projects. And it's the first, some of the first citizen science acoustic projects have been used, um, have been run using Audio Moth. It's also been widely adopted by NGOs, for profits and businesses. And to date, we've had about 259 citations of some of the research, research we published. Next, next slide, please. So with, with the support of group gets and all the campaigns that continually run, we, we're always developing new products. And um, some of them are the un, un, underwater acoustics case, which converts audio moth into an underwater device that's capable of recording sounds down to 30 meters. Um, we've deployed it for two months um, solid without having any leaks. And we've actually recorded the first orca whale um, back in South Africa, um, which is quite a big, big finding recently. Um, we've also produced audio moth dev, which it's more of a development board and it allows you, allows you to connect different things to Audio Moth like um, GPS modules. Our, our GPS module, we've developed a very own one which can localize gunshots now to it within 0.1 meter. And we've also developed Micromoth, which is a really small version of Audio Moth which can be used for animal born monitoring um, on, on tags. Um, next slide, please. So, what have we learned in this in this session and, and during our time developing Audio Moth? Multi multidisciplinary approaches help engineers solve real world problems. It's really useful to immerse yourself with users in the product, evaluate and iterate. It's good to grow alongside your user community and learn from them, and it's good to design for your user, but also to design for the scale of your problem. And Although, although, tra although traditional business models are, are great um, for technical design and product design, it's good to look, look beyond commercial, um, traditional business models and embrace approaches from the collaborative economy. Um, next slide, please. So yeah, if you want to learn more and about how we address some of the other challenges, visit our booth. I'll be around for the next um, hour or so before um, dinner in the UK. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andy. And I apologize for the technical difficulties there. Uh, we, we, we weren't prepared to present, but we worked it out and uh, we're going to keep working it out. And thank you for the amazing story. Um, and again, if anyone would like to visit Andy for the next hour, he'll be at his booth, which is the one with the really cool big tree and the audio math, um, audio moth attached to the tree. So thank you so much. Have a good one. Thanks a lot. Check it out.